when taking peptides orally, buffering the pepsinogen to pepsin conversion with something alkaline like bicarb will save the peptide from the pepsin breakdown. The arginate form we use protects it against the acidity, but a buffer, like you can use whatever you want to use as your buffer. You can even drink a heap of alkaline water or something before you take um, even the acetate form and you'll get a better absorption huh. orally. Tablespoon of bicarb soda with your peptides, you know, you might get a bit of re reflux or um, issues with the bicarb, but it'll protect the peptides from the proteolytic breakdown. Hey folks, so a few months ago, I got this special package with uh, some very unique and pretty inventive supplement formulations. And I get a lot of supplements, obviously. I probably get like eight different bottles of things to try on a weekly basis, maybe more. Uh, but this stuff was uh, particularly for healing the gut or, or, or at least fixing some problematic digestive issues. Uh, I had been familiar with uh, what many of you may have heard of in the past, BPC-157 as a peptide, a lot of people use for recovery. And the lesser known fact about BPC-157 is your gut makes it, at body protection compound 157. And it's not just for injuries, like as an injectable peptide, you can consume it orally and get some pretty impactful results as far as your gut stability and gut health goes. Now, when I began to look at some of these supplement formulations, there was one in particular that really leapt out to me and made me want to get the, the formulator of it on the show today. It was called the Ultimate Gut Repair Formula. And uh, it had a lot of French compounds you may not be familiar with, like lorazotide, acetate, uh, tributyrin, uh, something called Tudka, things that we'll, we'll actually take a dive into today. Uh, but I was just intrigued. I took it, and uh, I'm, I'm sad because I ran out of my bottle, but I felt like my gut was just able to... Uh, I don't know. I, I tend to have a little bit of a princess gut, I think, but this seemed to make it a little bit more of a steel gut, meaning I could like, you know, have the pizza that my wife makes slathered with cheese and the sourdough bread and, and you know, a glass of wine on the side and feel just absolutely fine or go out to eat to a restaurant that probably puts vegetable oils on its food and eat a meal that likely didn't have a, a great nutritional profile, at least from a, from a cleanliness standpoint and felt good. So anyways, the stuff is called the Gut Repair Formula, and the, the company is called Level Up Health, L-V-L-U-P Health, and my guest is Kyle Vanderleest. And uh, Kyle's new to the supplement scene, but he has a background as a naturopathic physician, functional health coach, a, a, a nutritionist, and uh, he's into finding orally bioavailable peptides, naturopathic botanicals, uh, kind of some fringe and very cool nutrition supplement ingredients. He's done a lot of trial and error, and he spent a lot of time studying up on this stuff. You'll get to hear his story today. As you're listening, everything that you hear, uh, I'll put show notes for at bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. I believe also, although I don't have it memorized or anything, that Kyle is offering some discounts on his supplements to you guys. So I'll make sure I put all that in the show notes as well. If you hear about some of this stuff, you want to try it at bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. Kyle, what's up, man? Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for the kind words about the product. I'm at six in the morning over here and uh, we managed to make it work with the time zone difference. So <laughs> thanks for accommodating. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you're, you're you're at least awake. Do what's your what's your morning routine? Do you do like an energy pick me up or have coffee or jump oh, up and down on a trampoline in the sunshine or anything or no just sunshine? Flip on Skype and go. Uh, today it was a special day. Obviously, with the podcast, the nootropics have, have been stacked on top of each other. Um, so <laughs> acetylcholine with alpha GPC, some macunaprians for dopamine, and oh, wow. uh, uh, one of your favorites, paraxanthine. Um, that's oh yeah. Incredible. Like, I love it. Of all the nootropics I've tried, bar maybe some of the synthetic ones, um, that's one of the hardest hitting and the best feeling ones that I've ever consumed. So, I do have access to iHerb, which is global. So, I've got Sean Miles other paraxanthine products, the pre workout one. And yeah, oh man, the swagger you get from that. I know that's sort of the, the key term they're using to describe it. It's, it's so true. And yeah, my brain feels awesome at the moment, despite the early, uh, early start. It's sick. That stuff's amazing. But you said you also take uh, choline and macuna, and is that is that a stack specifically that is meant to be taken together? Um, it's basically a stack to push dopamine and acetylcholine to get my brain working as quick as well as possible. Muscle Tech, I believe, are the other company who have access to paraxanthine with the the affinity, and yeah, you can buy on iHerb globally 
um, okay. that product. So happily, that's how I managed to get onto it. And I've been taking it for a good two months now. And it's directly replaced all pre-workouts for me. And like I'm barely even consuming caffeine anymore because of that. But yeah, taking that, the um, Macuna and a heap of ketone salts, because obviously you've spoken about it in the past. Magnesium, beta hydroxybutyrate is my favorite form. And yeah, just that energy yeah. pick you get. So that's yeah. how I've started my day. You know, the I'll thing with the ketone salts, though, did you know that to actually get adequate levels of uh, of of your your millimolar values of ketones high enough, the amount of salts you have to consume is actually either extremely acidic or a, an enormous amount of salts, almost like an unhealthy amount of salts. And and so the other problem with the salts is the uh, the configuration. A lot of them are using a, an, an isomer that isn't absorbed by the body that well. And I'm convinced increasingly that when it comes to using ketones, that esters are the way to go. Like like beta hydroxybutyrate with one three butane diol and these salts that which is like a ketone for those of you listening in. We're getting all geeky here. Bound to a salt like they. If you I don't know if you've compared the salts to the ester before, but I think the ester is just far superior. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. The ester I've had and used, and it definitely there's a stronger mental pick me up is just accessibility. I only had the salts and they do a little bit, not a lot comparatively. Yeah. yeah, you're definitely right there. And obviously with those potential side effects of taking the salts, the ester just makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, at least you're awake now. That's good. Um, t t <laughs> tell me, how'd you get into like supplements and formulations and, and biochemistry? Mm. So my journey sort of began about nine, 10 years ago now when my mum was diagnosed with cancer. Um, obviously, one of these truck moments is a lot it, for a lot of people. You have to have these really difficult things happen to you to sort of propel you into where, you, where, where you're going to be. I kind of compare Max, Max Ludovere with his mum. His mum had Alzheimer's and that sort oh, of yeah. set his trajectory forward and he became absolutely, absolutely obsessed with researching it and like not say it, I'm like him, but with cancer, I did the same thing with my mum. I really felt like the need to help her because there really wasn't much being offered at the time besides, you know, the standard of care. So I dove deep into the work of Thomas Seyfried, Dom D'Agostino and looked at mitochondrial health. And then, you know, you can't help but become a biohacker when you start looking into mitochondrial health. And that led me to podcasts like yours and Ben Bukowski's and Dave Asprey's. So it all, basically most of my learning is a big part thanks to you and your podcast but also you know there's dozens of fantastic resources online so that was while I was studying to be a nutritionist um and when I finished nutrition I got a job at a hyperbaric oxygen facility which was an awesome place to start um that's the only time I actually practiced at, um with clients was at that facility um I'm a naturopath now but I've never actually actually been a naturopath and worked with people one-on-one -on -one apart from uh, while I was studying at a health food store. But the hyperbaric oxygen facility where I worked was just trial by fire and hmm. one of the most formative years of my life because we, we, people who have hyperbaric oxygen treatments tend to either be elite performing athletes or very sick individuals with a chronic disease yeah. like cancer or an yeah. autoimmune disease. Yeah. And or, or, or like burns or wound victims, you know. Yeah, exactly. So being the technician there, I really just lapped up everything I could from these patients to learn what have you tried, what's been helping, you know, chronic diseases, people with traumatic brain injuries and um, the low hanging fruit for hyperbaric was the diabetes. So, you know, you learn about um, GDAs and people with Alzheimer's. So you learn about peptides like cerebral lysine and um, you learn the works of Max Ludovier and yourself. So that job combined with working at a health food store were really how I got into supplement supplements, formulations and natural health. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how'd you get interested particularly in the gut? Because, you know, I, I think I even heard you use the term leaky gut at one point, which I think still kind of sort of gets laughed at in modern medicine. At least that's been my experience, but I'm, I'm curious for you, like, like, was it leaky gut that first got you going down this road? And if so, what do you think of that whole term leaky gut? Yeah. So gut health is pretty much one of the core naturopathic tenets and principles. Hippocrates quote, all health begins in the gut. So that, that mindset of being the nat studying naturopathy sort of got me thinking, oh, it actually really does all begin 
in the gut and you are what you digest. And if you've got a dysfunction in any organ, most of it or any disease process, most of it can be stemmed back either from the gut or the gut being a contributing factor to said disease. So I got into that and also I've had my own issues with leaky gut and food sensitivities and being exposed to mold as well. That's like a Stanley knife to your gut lining. It will just completely rip it open. So I've had horrible gut issues in the past from mold exposure. Even while I had BPC at my dis- at my disposal, like if you're still around mold, it's not going to fix the problem. So I've definitely dealt with gut issues my whole life. But the main reason I actually developed the GI repair formula was for, for my housemate who had uh, Crohn's disease and was getting pretty bad to the point where they were considering putting her on a stroma bag. Mm. And so I just thought, ah, oh, I, I can't have this. I have to try and figure out something for her and... Funnily enough, she actually was a nurse, so she'd never actually thought naturopathic stuff or nutritional therapies were of any benefit. So she never even took the product that I made for her. But um, since then, it's helped thousands of people. And um, yeah, it's basically just an IBD formulation is why I made it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, back, back to that whole, it all begins with the gut thing. I sometimes, I don't want to be contrarian because I already know I was talking about the benefits of ketone esters versus ketone salts. Uh, but, you know, I, I sometimes think in functional medicine and naturopathic medicine, that phrase is sometimes overused. Now, I, I would think or I, I would estimate it's probably like 70 to 80 percent of stuff starts with the gut. If we if we say that the gut would include the mouth, too, because I think that the oral biome, the the shape of the jaw and the teeth and the mouth, the production of enzymes starting in the mouth, et cetera, is something that's often underdiagnosed or underlooked at. People who just have mouth issues before they have gut issues. But then, like I have seen and experienced myself, profound shifts in health, energy, sleep, healing, et cetera, from things like addressing fascial adhesions and really good deep tissue work and sometimes like months and months of deep tissue work to reinvent the body, especially in somebody who's been a a former athlete or another example would be the brain, you know, neurotransmitter imbalances from improper use of, you know, nootropics and smart drugs or antidepressants or, um, you know, some type of issue with the blood brain barrier, et cetera. Or even like um, another big one is emotions, right? There's whole books about that. Like the body keeps the score and the emotion code that dictate that someone could have like a pristine gut and 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 a poor emotional profile or poor mood or not a healthy spiritual practice and still fight an uphill battle with their health. So my, my take on the gut is I think a lot of it starts with the gut, but I don't think it all starts with the gut. All right. Sorry. That was a bit too much of a sweeping term. I 100% agree with that. And even myself too, like I'm so gut focused, but I, after living in mold, had colonization of mold in my sinuses. So no matter what I did, even removing myself, I had to address the the sinus cavity before I could actually heal and reduce the, um, the, the toxin release from the mold that was colonized in my sinuses. And then of course, you have relationships with people. If you're chronically stressed with people, then that's going to affect uh, catecholamine yeah. release and they're directly inflammatory to the gut too. So that's sort of, you're right, it is above that. And even, even as well, like if you want to go a step further, your environment too, if you're being nuked with EMFs every day, if you've got Bluetooth headphones on and or a laptop on your gut, the laptop on your gut yeah. is going to inflammation from that's going to basically lead to leaky gut as well. So the, we, we can keep going back and back and go even to like past lives and uh, things like yeah. the, Dutch, the Dutch famine as well. There's the studies around that. <laughs> so you can go back and back, but I feel like from the most practical perspective, if someone's going to take a supplement to work on themselves, then maybe the gut is where you start. But the free yeah. stuff, the meditations, the community, being a part of a community, that's definitely above gut health and that's where we'd where i'd like most people to start and look at yeah. before they take supplements for their gut yeah ideally obviously use a holistic approach and, and go after it all but the, you know the, the mold thing is interesting tell me about that about you, you said it colonizes the mouth and you got to break it down or something like that mm, it actually colonized my sinuses um and when i started taking i did neti pots and sinus cleansers mm-hmm. and i small amount i really got to iterate a small amount of n-acetylcysteine and a few biofilm busters in there and when i did that over about a, a week of flushing these just almighty uh what are they called uh biofilms with 
candida, not candida, with mold colonized in them would come out of my nose. Oh, and, man. Oh, I, the, the, the relief you get when you pass one of those biofilms is like when you've taken the best poo of your life, but in your nose. <laughs> so yeah. being able to actually breathe for the first time in what was months for me after the exposure was just like life changing. And then the reduction in neuroinflammation I had after that, because the sinus cavities, or there's like a very small membrane between the brain and um, the sinuses. That's why a lot of people use intranasal as a delivery mechanism for things like peptides or or even other compounds. So not having that small trickle of ocrotoxin go into my hippocampus and affect my cognition was just probably one of the most profound health upgrades that I've ever been able to do for myself. And I just, for weeks prior to that, were taking all the para cleansers and all the all yeah. the binders, internal mold, but I never actually got up here before all of the gut lining. So that was hugely impactful and it helped me. And yeah, it's to this day, I'm glad I can still breathe. And I've always got a neti pot handy in case I sort of go into a place with mold just to clear that out. And it's a very beneficial tool for a lot of people to have if they're unavoidably exposing themselves to mold spores. Yeah, I I have a similar approach when I'm traveling, especially in staying in an Airbnb or even on a on an airplane. I actually use a, a glutathione nasal spray with some essential oils in it. It's made by my friend Dr. John Lawrence at Mitozen, and it kind of burns, but you do a couple sprays into each nostril, and it seems to help out quite a bit. Also, with just general immunity when traveling. But I, you know, the the neti pot trick, or just like you know, this this a lot of people are doing this during COVID, like saline rinses. It's can be pretty powerful, just like a salt solution like that. It kind of makes you wonder how many people are walking around with mold or biofilm, especially in the nasal cavity. You know, I, I um that same guy who I mentioned, John Laurence, he does uh, cranial balloon adjustments in the nose where they. Have you ever had this done, Kyle, where they they put a balloon up the nose, inflate it, and it's like almost a chiropractic adjustment for the skull. And after you do it, sometimes you get this huge release of like mucus and, and strangely colored flecks and specks coming from the nose and your head feels clear as a bell. But I've had it done a few times and every time I wonder, gosh, in somebody who's never had this done, does that just mean you're walking around your whole life just kind of gummed up, you know, with, with things that have built up since since childhood? It, it could be. Um, I know Mike Mutzel, he's done a video on YouTube where he actually has a scan of his sinuses and he can see um, just how how congested and how backed up his sinus cavity was. And um, if it gets really bad, they can even get in there and remove it manually. But I think for most people, just doing steam, steaming, getting the steam up your nose is a really good way to dislodge yeah. it. But if those biofilms, you definitely need to do something that's going to break them down um, through the neti pot. So yeah, that was a, a really beneficial thing. And, you know, re getting rid of that sort of the systemic effects for my whole body was awesome. Like mold is such an, a shit thing to have happen to you in your body. Like it's so disruptive to hormones. It's so disruptive to, to, to satiety, uh, reduces um, MSH in your body. And that has a huge knock on effect to almost every system in the body. And it was really almost embarrassing for me to have gut issues as the formulator of what I call mm. the ultimate repair and still have issues with my gut. But, you know, when I was in the mold, there was no amount of BPC that could fix it because it's just that damaging to the gut lining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the whole wounded healer approach. I don't think there's anything wrong with having an issue and, and, and have to be dealing with that issue while it's simultaneously presenting the solutions you've discovered to the world. I think sometimes you, you have a little bit more of a practical, you know, trench based approach in a situation like that. So I, I get where you're coming from. And, and this, this formula, I mean, I know we've alluded to it a few times. I want to get into it momentarily, but I had one more question about mold and this idea of biofilms, because I've had to work with a few people and I'm not a doctor and I, I don't practice medicine, but some advice I've given to people that seems to have really moved the dial for candida and yeast and fungus has been high dose proteolytic enzymes, you know, like silkworm extract, serapeptase, trypsin, chymotrypsin, you know, papain, bromelain, et cetera, in high doses multiple times per day to, from what I understand, break down the biofilm. And then you combine that with an herbal uh, antimicrobial or antifungal agent like oil of oregano. And that seems to be a really good one-two combo. But the idea of using proteolytic enzymes to break down biofilm, do you think something like that would be effective for mold also? It's almost as if you listed off a upcoming formulation that I'm going to make. <laughs> <laughs> the enzymes, I really Oops. like um, chitosinase, which is 
breaks down actual mold and and um, candida, natokinase, uh, glucomylase, mm -hmm. and um, lumbrokinase is another one that are really good. But it, it doesn't necessarily need to be really these specific forms. Like most of these pr proteolytic enzymes, if they can get systemic, if they're going to survive the the gut lining, they get into like a colonized gut, then they're fantastic. But having taken those, I didn't actually use them in a sinus cavity, which I wish I did. But I'm not really sure if there'd be any contraindications to taking proteolytic enzymes in your nasal cavity. It could yeah. potentially eat away at the tissue there. I, I don't think it would because there's plenty of mucus in there to sort of protect you. But um, I never did those. But I potentially, if I get it again, I might try that out and see how it goes. But um, I did have a friend who nebulized um, the proteolytic enzymes and definitely oh. not a good idea to do that because <laughs> the lung i don't think is meant to have any proteolytic enzymes in it and it really burnt the lungs and was yeah. coughing for days after so yeah that's like ozone right don't don't breathe it in but that that is interesting you know and i i guess i've only thought about oral consumption uh for getting into the bloodstream etc but yeah I, I wasn't proposing spraying it up the nose but there's yeah, that's interesting. But you think the saline rinse will break down the mold biofilm pretty well? Mm, the saline and maybe some of the botanicals like some citrus essential oils. There's mm -hmm. a essential oil blend called Citri Cleanse, or I've forgotten exactly the name of it, but it, yeah, it's just citrus-based. Um, you could use other things like grapefruit extract. That's a really good one. Um, there's actually a product coming out from a company, I believe, that you know, Symbiotica. Are you, are you yeah. in, do you go? they're bringing out a, a para x one and it's got some very very interesting new compounds one's called cafeic acid phenyl phenyl ethyl ester and that seems to be like one of the best ingredients that you could use for taking care of both parasites and mold at the same time and that's oh. in this really big over almost almost overdone in what they put in it but i really like that like if it sort of fits with my philosophy of they've just made like, like an all-in-one parasite and candida mold cleanse product, and it looks absolutely amazing if you look at the ingredient panel on it. Is that the uh, the Para X by Symbiotica? I think it's called Para X. It might be okay. para something else, but yeah, it's Symbiotica's okay. new parasite. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll um, hunt it down and and put a put a link to it in the show notes for folks. Um, actually, I found the ingredient label right here. Yeah, phy phytanoic. Uh, Andrographolide and phytoshore curcumin as curcuminoids, elagic acid, bisaline and bisalin, uh, luteolin and caffeic acid phenol, phenethyl ester, along with like monolaurin from coconut oil, oregano. Wow, this is a, this is a pretty uh, intense formula. Interesting. Yeah, I hmm. couldn't find like as I said, I was working on something for myself for my for level up and then i saw this one i'm like oh damn he bet me to it <laughs> <laughs> that's is, happened that's happened to me at Keon before <laughs> I, I didn't actually answer one of your questions before you you sort of were touching about leaky guts you know if the terms even accepted and oh, i yeah. think it's i think it's gradually getting more accepted by people but it's still like a colloquialism just something people use it just in general speak more so than you would at your doctor's office they they use the term intestinal hyperpermeability, and I think that's way more accepted. And if you use Google Scholar or PubMed and search intestinal hyperpermeability, you're going to get substantially more results if you're looking yeah. into condition. So that that's yeah. the key term to use. But leaky gut's definitely a thing, whether whatever you want to call it. Um, zonulin is a huge factor in leaky gut. Um, that zonulin protein is triggered by stresses like gliadin from gluten, um, mm -hmm. pesticides like glyphosate, these and to certain toxins um, trigger, they bind to the outside of the enterocytes of the, of the intestine. And then once, they, once those molecules bind to it, your, your epithelium release this molecule called zonulin. Zonulin is something you can test for in both blood and fecal, but this is basically a marker of leaky gut. Because the more zonulin you have, the more permeable your gut membrane will be. It the gut membrane is like a mesh, and zonulin basically increases the the pore size of, of your mesh to to let things in. It has a physiological role. It's not all bad. Like we need certain amounts of zonulin to increase absorption of certain um, certain things from the diet, but too much is and too and chronic um, release of this 
is what we would what is what would lead to something like leaky gut and can actually lead to things like food sensitivities a lot of the time people who eat the same food e- almost every day for a whole year will develop a sensitivity to the food it happened to me with eggs hmm. and this is because some of the fragments of the the egg that you've eaten some of the amino acids of that in due time will actually cross that membrane barrier and then interact with your immune system and then you might get like an igg response to even healthy foods it just happens when you don't eat seasonally okay but interesting that that can go away it, it won't end up as like a, a long-term you know immune response to that like an allergy it's just like a accumulation effect and you know zonulin is one of the key contributors to things crossing the the the, the um the the gut membrane yeah but it's the only thing there's there's plenty of other things that contribute to leaky gut but I think the main thing to focus on is how do you actually fix this? If you have, like, if you've tested your gut, you can test it, as I said, in fe- fecal or in um, serum and see your zonulin levels. But you can also do something called the GI map, which is a, a fecal microbe um, test. I believe you've done one of those before. Yeah. yeah. Yep, I have multiple times. Yeah. Oh, they're so fun to do digging through your poo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a little hot dog tray and a little spoon and the, and the tubes that they include with it. Yeah, I think. The, uh, the three-day uh, panel by Genova Diagnostics is a good one because a lot of times if you're looking especially at parasites, you know, you're, you're not going to catch them, so to speak, with just a one snapshot of a measurement. you got to do multiple days in a row to really get a good profile of the bacteria and the, and the biome and the critters in the gut. But yeah, I, I think anybody who hasn't done a gut test yet, back to the reason that you were indicating many health issues arise, you know, beginning with the gut, I think anybody who's concerned about their long-term health should test it. I don't even think you need a full biome bacterial profile, like a gut biome or a biome or something like that. I think even just getting, you know, like a Genova diagnostics, that's going to give you parasites, yeast, fungus, candida, et cetera, is a, is a good way to go. And for those of you listening in, zonulin, it can be confusing, but zonulin would increase the permeability of the tight junctions between the cells. And so A, if you're talking to your doctor, don't use the term leaky gut, like Kyle just said. If you want him to take you seriously and sound smart, use the term high intestinal permeability or something like that, something uh, more multisyllabic. And then the other thing is with zonulin, you technically want to, uh, you'd want to decrease the activity of zonulin. Have you ever looked into colostrum for that, by the way, Kyle? Yeah, I have. I love colostrum. It's a lot of coaches that I work with use that in their protocols. It's just one of those things that certain people might have a reaction to, to it being Mm -hmm. a dairy that it's sort of like it's hit or miss, but yeah, in theory, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm sensitive to dairy, but I feel great on colostrum. So I'll I'll do typically a couple of colostrum smoothies each week that I'll just, you know, make my usual smoothie, but just put boatloads of colostrum in it. And I always feel amazing with that. Now, the the gut repair formula, I want to get into that because it's it's kind of complex. So tell me about the the gut repair formula and the actual ingredients that are in it and, and what they're actually doing. I realize that's an involved question because there's multiple ingredients, but I'd, I'd love to hear you fill me in on the details of it. Yeah, sure. So there's basically a combination of peptides and then combined with some of the most powerful nutritional and naturopathic compounds that I could find that you can fit in a capsule. Obviously, there's things like uh, marshmallow root, there's things like L-glutamine, but you need a really high dose of those and sort of long-term use to get benefit from those. Um, The ingredients that I've used in this formulation, peptides are huge, like huge potential for what they can do for people, not only for gut health, but for medicine. I'm not the first and I won't be the last to say this, but peptides are the future of medicine. Um, They don't have, most of them don't have toxicity, especially if they're found um, somewhere in the body, like BPC, as you mentioned at the start of the show, that's found in your stomach acid. It's a stomach acid secretion. And the reason why your stomach secretes it is to protect your stomach from the hydrochloric acid if you get something like an ulcer or if you get H. pylori or something that's affecting the integrity of the stomach, that can be catastrophic for the body. If you know, if you have a leak of hydrochloric acid into your torso, that would that would be the end of it for you. That's not yeah. a good situation to be in acid burning through your body. So your body has a heap, like it's a really thick organ in the stomach. So that's one contingency. There's a heap of mucus in it, so there's another. But I believe this peptide's produced in there to heal that organ as fast as possible because as I said that's um that's game over if that if that organ goes wrong but um yeah so BPC is body no, no, protection a, compound a quick question about BPC 
uh, obviously for the purposes of repairing the gut or affecting the gut, oral administration seems to just make like intuitive common sense. But if someone were to inject BPC-157 using the traditional peptide administration route of like using an insulin syringe to inject, do you think if they didn't have access to oral BPC-157, there'd still be an effect on the integrity of the gut? Yeah, because it ends up in circulation. This is something that I've sort of mused with with other people in the space, whether oral versus injectable, like does it actually matter when it all ends up in circulation anyway? And it, um, Jean-Francois said peptides are like they're smart in the sense that they will go to areas of inflammation. They're not going to just enter cells that don't need them. They're sort of the term bioregulator is one that's been used. And I think peptides definitely um, fit that description as well. They they don't do anything if they're not needed. Um, if you have if there's a site of inflammation, then they'll just attract themselves to it and um, stimulate all these repair processes. But if there's actually no need for it, it'll just circulate and then be broken down in circulation by hydrolyzed enzymes. But to answer your question, if someone had injectable form of BPC, you can inject that and it would elicit some benefits. But it's sort of like you want to get as close to the site of injury as possible. If you have gut issues, oral is just makes sense. It's going to go directly through your GI tract, all of it, and get to wherever it's need, needed to. Another way that you can do it is if you have like large bowel pathologies like IBD, Crohn's or colitis, is there are BPC suppositories, which is another way you can do it. Um, that bypasses the chance that the, all the BPC you take through the mouth might get used up earlier in the small intestines or in the stomach. So for people who have large bowel pathologies, you almost need to do a higher dose to sort of oversaturate the earlier parts of the digestive system to actually let it get down there. But then that that has actually worked in, in practice, but this is sort of where it's a bit con contradictory. It enters circulation, so do you even need to do that anyway? Um, yeah. That's something that I think needs to be studied a bit better by people in the space. But unfortunately, I'm not seeing too much new BPC research coming out. And that's obviously because it's a non-patentable natural compound that, you know, unless there's yeah. millions to be made and millions right. to be made from the, the money that it costs to study this, it's not really being pushed. So, Yeah, not a lot of financial incentive. Now, what about the other peptide? And, and I want to hear about the other ingredients as well, because, it, you know, many people will find great results from just taking oral BPC-157, which, by the way, I think you have that available on your website, just BPC-157 all by itself, right? I really hate function. I really hate useless fillers in products. So I've added palmitol ethanolamide (PEA) as the filler, along with hyaluronic acid, which would synergize with BPC 157's effect on collagen networks. Um, huh. So I piggyback those two together and put a bit of sodium bicarbonate too, because when taking peptides orally, buffering the pepsinogen to pepsin conversion with something alkaline like bicarb will save the peptide from the pepsin breakdown. The arginate form we use protects it against the acidity but a buffer like you can use whatever you want to use as your buffer you can even drink a heap of alkaline water or something before you take um even the acetate form and you'll get a better absorption huh. orally but yeah no just buff, just buffers like wow. it, a table tablespoon of bicarb soda with your peptides you know you might get a bit of free, reflux or um, issues with the bicarb but it'll protect the peptides from the proteolytic breakdown Wow, that's an amazing tip. That's really good to know. See, I it, so if you were to take oral BPC-157 all by itself, the acidic environment combined with some of the cofactors not being necessary for a high enough bioavailability would dictate that, like you mentioned, it's not going to reach the, the collagen that works as effectively or have as great an impact on the gut. Exactly, yeah. The, there's two things most people use. Injectable, they tend to use the acetate form. This form is about eight times cheaper than the arginate form. The mm -hmm. arginate form is the one they call the stable form. This the form that has this 90% um, bioavailability and it's capable of with, withstanding the stomach acid. But the other thing, the thing with that is it does withstand the stomach acid. And when they test it, they basically just put it in acid and correct, it does withstand it, but not factored into that are the proteolytic enzymes. So Whenever you're taking any oral peptides, I recommend people take it away from a high protein meal. If you've just eaten a big chunk of steak or a piece of chicken, your stomach acid is going to drop as close to one as it's capable of doing. 
and it's going to upregulate a heap of the proteolytic enzymes to break down that chicken mm. or that stuff. And then if you put like GI repair or regen, BPC, KPV, any oral peptide after that, you're not really giving it a good chance to be absorbed. Okay. And you use the arginate form in, yeah, in yeah. both your formulas that have BPC. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing okay. but the best form. I'm not going to waste people's time with the acetate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the BPC-157 is the first ingredient and obviously one of the major staples of the gut repair formula, but what else do you have in there? The second peptide in there is KPV. This is a fragment of melanocyte stimulating hormone, alpha MSH, um, okay. which is the parent, the parent peptide of quite a few different um, peptide fragments. So there mm. is melanotan, melanotan 1 and 2. They both come from MSH. Um, I believe you've used them in the past to quite interesting effect. Um, KPV, KDPT, there's all these fragments of this main um, MSH um, peptide. And by only using a fragment, you're basically selecting. It's like a selective peptide modulator rather than like a SARM, which is a selective androgen. You can have a – by, by breaking them down to a fragment, like the KPV is a three amino acid fragment of MSH. It basically makes it more specific to certain receptors. We've got five key um, melanocortin receptors, MC1 receptor. That's responsible for your tanning, for hair color. Um, that's where melanotan shines. It really has a strong affinity for that one. Um, melanotan actually works on most of the receptors, but something like KPV will work on the other benefits of the melanocortin system in the body. It'll bind more to the three and the four and the three is responsible for like energy homeostasis. It's responsible for the two it, it also binds to, which is responsible for adrenals and steroidogenesis. Mm -hmm. And I believe PT141 is another one of these MSH fragments, and that has more of an affinity for the two. And that's why a lot of people use it as a sexual arousal peptide, and it works yeah, on- Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the side, uh, well, like a bodybuilder who would use melanotan for increased skin pigmentation. The side effect is often, uh, what do you call it, priapism, like uh, erections that will not go away. I <laughs> had a similar experience that you just alluded to where- I'd take it because I wanted to just see what it did and how it worked. But the problem is trying to sleep with an erection. It's just, it's nearly impossible. And so I, I didn't like the way I felt on that stuff very much either way. But this KPV, that's more of, of something that's, that's found in or makes up part of the larger melanotan. But by itself, it's actually having more like antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, antifungal type of uh, effects on the gut? Precisely. Um, okay. It just removes those unwanted side effects of, I mean, I wouldn't mind if it tanned me without giving me uncontrollable erections. Like that would be good, but it basically removes the binding to the one, which is responsible for the tanning. It has a lower affinity for the ones that stimulate sexual arousal, and it's more focused in on the immune the immune system, the immune cells, certain um, immune cells have melanocortin receptors too. And that can, and that's why KPV is a fantastic peptide for people who've had Lyme disease or who have chemical mm. sensitivities. And a big reason why I included it too was it comes back to mold. People who have been exposed to mold, their melanocortin um, MSH is substantially reduced, like up to a 90% reduction in endogenous MSH production. So um, KPV basically is like supplementing MSH in, in the effects that you want from MSH. So that was really beneficial in bringing my energy back up, helping my immune system for mold and I think Lyme disease, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. It's really beneficial for that because the, the cascade of effects that the melanocortin system have, um, and brain too, you got a heap of, um, MC receptors in the brain. So oh, really? it's a yeah, I think um, a lot of the one, I think it's C-Max is one of the brain peptides. And I think uh -huh. that's an A, yeah, I think that's one of the, it binds to the melanocortin system in the brain too. And that's where it has really potent anti-inflammatory effects and anti-Alzheimer's effects too. Um, yeah. So yeah, in the, in the gray matter, there's a lot of receptors for melanocortin. And so that's a really, that's a benefit of going in the sun for one, but it's also, you know, um, benefits to MSH and why mold is so, almost like a prerequisite for 
chronic conditions like if you've been exposed to it in the past you are increasing your chances of things like alzheimer's because you're not making msh therefore you're not msh isn't binding to these anti-inflammatory pathways in the brain and you know there's things you can do from there but if you don't know and as we said if people are going along with colonized mold in their sinuses for years unknowing then you're just getting this slow little trickle and this gradual reduction in msh production so yeah kpv is fantastic for that and that's why i included it in the in yeah. the formula now now in america one really popular peptide it seems right now is ll37 which is like an antimicrobial peptide a lot of people swear by that for example for for SIBO particularly have you heard of that or is there a reason that you didn't include that one in the formula um i've heard of it and i didn't include it because a it was d- very difficult to get like i don't think i mm. could have could get it at the time but b it can cause really severe die-off reactions to people when you oh like, uh, yeah like a herxheimer it, reaction exactly exactly and, and if people need it then it's fantastic but i wouldn't add it to something that's for the general population because i don't want people to feel like shit after they've had the product i want people yeah. to feel good and that's sort of um what most people get from it unless they have a reaction to zinc zinc carnosines another one of the ingredients and I put a, a heaped dose of that in there, like a really clinically clinically dosed amount of it. But some people get nausea from zinc. I don't know if you experienced any of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it depends on the form. Like at Keon for our immune formula, I use zinc bisglycinate, which seems to be a form that doesn't cause gastric upset in people that the dose is necessary for immune support. But yeah, some forms of zinc can cause issues. The, the bisglycinate seems pretty well tolerated though. So it did, so BPC-157 and KPV, those would both be considered peptides. KPV, obviously, a little bit of a smaller peptide, like a tripeptide, which means it's just, for those of you listening in, it's just like three three peptides or three amino acids bound together. Um, and then uh, you, I noticed you also have something called lorazotide, lorazotide acetate. Yep. What's that? One. It's codenames AT1001 for people who want to research it. This is a very simple- Sounds like a secret very- agent. <laughs> license to stop zonulin that's uh that's it's what it, its function is um and it's very specific unlike the other two there's like a plethora of benefits to bpc and kpv and it you know when you take bpc to heal your gut you'll actually notice like reduction in neuroinflammation it might help it's organoprotective so you've got these pleiotropic effects from bpc and kpv but lorazotide is more specific this is a we spoke about zonulin earlier and how that's sort of whack the leading one of the main factors in leaky gut well lorazotide is simply an antagonist to, to zonulin it's derived from um endotoxin i believe i can't remember exactly but it's an antagonist to zonulin um it binds to the receptors in which um zonulin would bind to in the cells and basically prevents that hyperpermeability from even happening the analogy i use when i describe why i use lorazotide in the formula it's like if someone has a wound on their on their shoulder, for example, and you've got you, it's the equivalent of putting staples in the wound or stitches. It seals it up. While on the other end, you've got the two anti-inflammatory, pro-angiogenic, pro-growth factor, um, EGF peptides working from within to heal it. Um, the lorazotide's like the staples holding the gut lining or the wound together in the gut, and um, it's being studied mainly for celiac disease. Um, obviously, zonulin and celiac. Um, gliadin triggering zonulin is the mechanism for that. So it's being studied quite heavily for celiac disease and it's code, it's nicknamed the anti-celiac peptide as well. Um, really? That, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's like colloquially, colloquially what they call it. Um, but yeah, it's one function is to inhibit zonulin and, you know, um, the other effect that you can get from inhibiting zonulin is systemic too it's not just in your gut where zonulin has effects zonulin can actually open up the blood brain barrier it can cause neuroinflammation so by inhibiting it at the gut we inhibit its absorption into the into the circulation and then we want to prevent it from going into the blood brain barrier because i personally believe a lot of people's brain fog is caused by leaky gut and the mechanism for that would be zonulin's opening the blood brain barrier or things like lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins or even toxins generally that are circulating should not end up in the brain. But I believe leaky brain is a big issue at the moment that that lorazotide yeah. and all these, anything gut healing, anything that's going to seal the gut lining is going to benefit for the brain as well. And that's sort of yeah. the, blood, the gut brain connection there through the circulation. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And then there, um, gosh, I mean, those are only three of the ingredients. We've barely scratched the surface here, but, but I, I, I know that you have, uh, the zinc in there, like you mentioned, zinc carnosine and, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the other three that you have are quercetin, tributyrin and tudka. And mm -hmm. although we, we may not have time to cover every single ingredient in this formula, the tudka particularly, that's one I've heard a lot about. And a lot of people seem to be very into this tudka thing. Tell me about tudka. Tudka is actually not in the GI repair formula. It's its oh. own standard product. Um, okay. It's, do, do you it's, stack that with this product sometimes? or? Yeah, yeah it's a bile salt. Um, you okay. can stack it with it. It really is beneficial for SIBO. Like bile acids have a really great modulatory effect on um, bacterial overgrowth. Bile in a high enough dose is capable of wiping out the, the negative, gram-negative bacteria for SIBO. So that's one of the benefits to it. Um, but its main benefit is promoting drainage and phase three detoxification. Um, hmm. It has a ceiling effect on the gut too. And as I said, it, anything that's going to positively influence the microbiome, like KPV and like even some probiotics or some prebiotics, um, they're going to be beneficial for the gut lining. But Tudka is its own standalone product because most people need between seven, 250 milligrams. And if people have taken oral steroids, um, oral testosterone that really has an ability to clog up the bile and Tudka is a water soluble bile salt and it thins the bile and gets it flowing a lot better. Hmm. Um, this prevents things like cholestasis. Um, if people have elevated liver enzymes, it's just one of the quickest acting compounds for lowering those. And when, again, like bring it back to when I was in mold, mold congests and clogs up the, the bile. So when I took a, a large dose of that, again, I had almost a Herxheimer reaction to the Tudka because it finally cleared cleared the uh, the liver out, which is a big thing that a lot of people overlook. And I think when it comes to detoxification, we need to start from the gut, work our way back to drainage, such so phase three, and then we start to actually modify the phase one and phase two of the liver detoxification rather than starting with something like milk thistle, which would upregulate phase one and then can actually, if you don't have drainage open, if you don't have essential amino acids or glycine or NAC to support that phase two of liver clearance, you can actually end up with an accumulation of these intermediate intermediary metabolites and cause actual liver inflammation rather than helping it. So, yeah. Wow. Okay, so so the Tudka, arguably, if you um, were to eat like a higher fat diet, maybe a carnivore diet, a ketogenic diet, et cetera, it sounds to me like that would actually help quite a bit with the production of bile to support the digestion of that. Because a lot of people get fatty stool and digestive distress from a diet like that. But it sounds like Tudka could fit in pretty well in a scenario like that. Absolutely. The, the, the lowest hanging fruit for Tudka is it's basically a direct replacement for people who take ox bile. It has, it'll give you all okay. of the best for fat absorption as ox bile would but then it has all these other effects um such as you know helping the liver which ox bile doesn't do and then it also yeah. has beneficial effects for reducing endoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum stress so it helps hmm. with protein folding as well um helps mitochondrial um production and also helps um with the conversion of t4 to t3 it, it helps the um deiodinize enzymes in, for the thyroid conversion in the liver so one of my friends who's a coach um, in Australia took it and he asked me if there was any, if, he, if I'd laced the product with anything because he had such an uptick in energy and he was, he had a little bit of mold in his environment, but taking the Tudka cleared out his, his, um, his liver and then also really positively affected his thyroid conversion through to the active T3 and he felt amazing from it, really energized purely from something that, you know, that's one of the side benefits of the, of, a side reason why someone would take Tudka rather than the primary. So. As a direct replacement for ox bile, it's fantastic. You had um, Dane Johnson, hmm. Crohn's Colitis. Yeah, uh, on Crohn's Colitis Lifestyle. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's awesome. He loves Tudka. He uses that for most of his, most of his patients with um, GI issues and anyone okay. who's been old or anyone who's got problems with drainage, which is a lot of people nowadays. So um, wow. Cellcorp also have a, a good Tudka as well. And I think they've got a proprietary blend of Tudka with some melatonin and a few other things. But yeah, yeah that's that's Tudka. That's not actually even part of the GI repair, but that's just one of my favorite products. What um, are the that, other ingredients in the GI repair then besides the BPC-157, the KPV, and the lorazotide? Well, that's where the naturals come in. The zinc carnosine, I've got a dose, I think it's at 50 milligrams. I think you get a zinc carnosine from that, which okay. is, and that's why people end up with gastric distress. I think the average 
supplemental dose of zinc is about t- equivalent to 10 milligrams, which for most people is fine. But 50 is a big dose, and that's why maybe one out of 10 people might have some degree of upset stomach from GI repair, um, in which case you just split the dose and that'll you know only give you 25. But it, again, still, if people have issues with that, then taking it with some fats or some carbohydrates will prevent that. Um, okay. That's zinc scene. That's fantastic for soothing the stomach. Carnosine in and of itself is just a fantastic amino acid. But when you combine it with zinc, which has a strong healing effect on the gut lining and is very important. And it's a reason why people with IBD um, really struggle to fix their gut is because of the damage to the, the gut lining. You don't get um, very good absorption of, of dietary zinc. So zinc's like one of the key um, minerals that we need for healing the gut lining. So zinc carnosine, um, just I couldn't think of a better form to use for healing the mm. gut. Um, then there's tributyrin, which is a really bioavailable form of butyrate. And butyrate is just a short ch- chain fatty acid which feeds the enterocytes and the colonocytes. Um, really potent anti-inflammatory too. It's a histone deacetylase inhibitor. So a lot okay. of people with colon cancer are taking big doses of this to sort of help them. Um, it inhibits the NF kappa beta inflammasome, and it's a COX two inhibitor as well. So um, there's a few different forms of butyrate you can supplement. I think it's Body Bio have calcium magnesium butyrate, but the tributyrin form I think is the best, um, and provides the most butyrate. Like I think there's three butyric acid molecules bound to glycerol, and it's capable of getting through this through the um, stomach acid and through the entire um, small and large intestine. Okay. Now, now butyrate, it's, it's very, uh, very much a part of the colonic environment. And I know part of a healthy, large intestine. Have you ever heard of people using these uh, butyrate enemas, like, like taking butyric acid up the other end? Yeah. I think Dane just mentioned it to me that he was using like most of what's in GI repair. He's given to people as suppositories or enemas or got them compounded that way. So, um, it would be good. I can't imagine it would be the most pleasant thing to have because Tributyrin um, tastes and smells like fermented cheese. And yeah, it doesn't is, smell that is, great. No, I don't think any of the butyrate forms are great. Tudka is another one, which is horrible. Tudka sort of smells and tastes like nail polish remover because it's an acid. But back to butyrate, yeah, you could definitely do it as an enema. I would suggest for people with large bowel pathologies, Crohn's and colitis, doing things as suppositories or enema is, uh, is going to get these compounds as quickly and as efficiently as possible to the side of inflammation. But you can definitely do them orally as well. Um, mm-hmm. I've had thousands of customers, many of which have large bowel pathologies, and um, they've definitely noticed a huge Im- improvement in their in their conditions, taking the formula, taking things like Tudka yeah. and, and just general anti-inflammatories on top of that too. It's really, as far as gut healing goes, BPC is the powerhouse of the formula. Yeah. But when you combine VPC, which stimulates all these growth factors with other things, which synergize with those growth factor stimulations with the anti-inflammatory effects, with the pro gut healing effects of these compounds, and even just the energy substrate for the um, the colonic cells as well with the butyrate, you're getting you're overlapping on so many mechanisms which are important to hit if you really want to nourish the gut and help heal the gut lining. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it seems like it can cover so many bases, this formula. And then and then you you uh, mentioned you have quercetin in there also? Yeah, I've got two forms of quercetin. Um, there's anhydrous, which has terrible bioavailability. I think it's only 2%. But I kept that in there because it's actually really good. If it's if it's embedding itself in the mucosa of, of the stomach lining and not getting systemic, then it's having a local effect. It's, it's, it's preventing um, uh, histamine in the lumen. Um, histamine is another thing um, that can cause uh, a flushing reaction in the body. Your body, if people have history, histamine intolerance or um, mast cell activation syndrome, they have chronically high levels of histamine. And this could be due to something like a parasite or food sensitivities or w- whatever the cause is. Yeah. The, the effect is the histamine opens the permeability of the gut lining to try and get stuff out of your body, to flush it out, and then you end up with something like diarrhea. Um, or and then systemically histamine too gives you the effects of like itchy eyes, runny nose, and yeah, um, yeah so quercetin is the best ma- one of the best mast cell stabilizing ingredients that I could use, and mast cells definitely contribute. It also has a direct sealing effect on on the um, on the gut as well, 
And then the other form of quercetin I used is one called enzymatically modified isoquercetin, EMIQ. Okay. This, this works on the other side. So this works on the other side of the um, of the of the uh, the gut lining. So anhydrous is sort of in the lumen, and EMIQ has forty times the absorption supposedly from the manufacturer, but uh, forty times more bioavailable form of quercetin. So this gets systemic. This gets on the other side of the of this of the uh, gut lining, and this is going to have antihistamine effects in the body. It's it's a, one of the best antihistamines, maybe bar. Um, something like diamine oxidase (DAO), it's probably the the second best of the mast cell stabilizing ingredients, and you really don't need much due to its high bioavailability. And hmm. this is just such a great compound. You can get it on iHerb, you can get it in GR Repair, and um, for yeah. anyone who has seasonal allergies, there's nothing better than uh, EMIQ, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you look at gut issues, everything from the mast cell and histamine sensitivities that you've described to intestinal permeability to candida yeast or other fungus to, you know, the mold that you talked about to, uh, um, you know, sensitivities to certain things like, like gluten or, or lactose to poor bile production or gallbladder or liver function. There's, there's so many reasons, but in your description, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like this formula is kind of like a shotgun formula that's just covering all the bases for each of those different issues that could cause problematic gut issues. Exactly. Its it, its key goal is to fix leaky gut, the hyperpermeability. Um, there are t- times when it won't work. If someone has horrible dysbiosis or candida overgrowth, like KPV has an effect on the immune system, which then the immune system might be able to take care of the overgrowth. But a lot of the time I find this this product will work really well for anyone with leaky gut issues. But when it doesn't work, it's usually dysbiosis or poor environment hmm. like I had with mold. Um, yeah. The one thing, it the, the butyrate's also fantastic and, and quercetin as well. It's stimulating um, mucus release. And that mucus membrane, that mucus layer is if the, the gut lining is only one cell thick, the mucus lining can be up to like 50 to 100 times thicker than that. It's not an actual cell, but it's basically the moat for which yeah. the castle yeah. stomach lining. So building that moat with products like, I think another company have one called Mega Mucosa, and even the colostrum you take is really good at helping stimulate the mucosa mucus production. But um, if you've got dis, uh, dysbiosis in your in your in your gut, then these gram negative and these pathogenic bacteria actually eat away at the mucus and thin hmm. that out to the point where you don't really have much of a, of a line of defense against other things that might be wanting to get into your into your circulation and invade yeah. and attack your own gut lining. Wow. Wow. Man, it's 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 such a good formula. I know we're running tight on time because you've got like skin peptides and some anti-aging skincare products, a whole bunch of other stuff. I, your, your site's going to be super fun for people to explore. And I'll link to it, bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. But one question I, I did want to ask you before I let you go, Kyle, is as far as the usage of this thing, do you take this with the meal? Do you take it on an empty stomach? Do you take it multiple times per day? Or what's the best way to use it once you get a bottle? I recommend people try first um, away from food. But as we said with the zinc carnosine, at such a high dose, it might be unavoidable that you have nausea. So taking it with fats or carbs is a really good way to prevent that nausea, but just not a high amount of protein. Um, The other formula that has BPC or the KPV, the standalones, they don't have that zinc in it, so most people aren't going to react to them. The only time some might react negatively is if they have have issues with fats because the other two have palmitol ethanolamide, PEA, which is a fatty acid. It's not in a huge amount, but I have heard maybe one out of a 1,000 people might react negatively to the PEA in any any fat. But um, yeah, taking it before meals is good too, if, especially if you know you're going to go out and be exposed to something that's going to trigger leaky gut. Like if you know you're going to go out for some crap food or um, yeah. have a pizza or a burger, taking having lorazotide as that zonulin antagonist in circulation is going to prevent and reduce the damage that you would otherwise sustain from a, a cheat meal. Yeah, maybe that's why I noticed the big effects when I'd use it when eating out. Like it's perfect for date night or going out to a restaurant or traveling, in my opinion. Like that's that's where I really seem to notice the best effects on gut stability because I eat pretty clean at home. But man, like just to have this in, in your back pocket, your first aid kit for travel is, is amazing. So I, I know we're running short on time and I have another uh, podcast coming up here. So I, I got to get going pretty soon. But what I'll do, 
for folks listening in, um, bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. I'll put more information about the supplement, the label, some of the some of the details about it. And uh, I think we have a discount code somewhere. I'll hunt it down. I'll put it in there as well so you can go check this out. Uh, I would also encourage you to surf around and, and look at some of Kyle's other products, particularly if you get like the gut repair formula, you get the TUD cut to go along with it if you want a little bit better bioflow, if you're in a high fat diet for some of the other reasons that we mentioned. Um, I feel like we're going to have to do a round two, Kyle, because like you, you go deep on this stuff and I would love to geek out with you again if you're game. Yeah, it sounds good. We didn't even touch on skin peptides. I've got um, yeah. GAA, which is a teen precursor coming out. Yep. Dihydroisidin, which you've mentioned as well, is like an anti-hangover, anti-alcohol one. There's just yeah. the backlog is pretty, pretty endless as well as the skin peptides. So Sweet. your codes are Ben Tan, Greenfield, BGL, or Greenfield. You've got all of them. Anyone oh. that you've used, all. You. <laughs> they just all work. Just type them all in. All right. Well, cool, man. Um, I'm, I'm excited for people to, to get their hands on this stuff and give me feedback. And if you guys have questions for me or Kyle, uh, leave them in the show notes. Go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. You can leave your questions, your comments, your feedback there. Uh, we'll be happy to, to hop in and help you out. If you have any issues with with ordering or anything like that, you can you can let us know too. And uh, again, that's bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. And uh, Kyle, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all this stuff with us, man. You're, you're a wealth of knowledge. It's an absolute honor. And as I said, during my cancer journey, Ben, your podcast gave me so much invaluable information and oh. helping my mom live way longer than she would have otherwise. So a big oh, thank man. you to you. You do. Dude, that, that, that makes my day. Thank you so much, man. Um, right. Well, folks, I think that's a good note to end on. So bengreenfieldlife.com slash LVL. And until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Kyle Vandalise, signing out from Ben Greenfield Life. Have an amazing week. Mm-hmm.